we are continuing with the chapter of structural organization in animals in our last lecture we continued or rather we completed nervous tissue all right today we're going to take a, a very interesting step to all the animals which are there all right so before we actually start learning the different types of animals and how are they uh, classified or rather what are their distinctive features let's just have a brief input on what are the different uh, ways that we can classify an animal now you know that there are trillions of animals on this earth right now isn't it very difficult to actually take a one one animal and try to study each and every part of it well what do we do for that why aren't we isn't that a better way to classify those animals so that we can know the similarity between them and then studying them becomes much easier so now there are different ways on which we are able to classify those animals all right the first and foremost thing that we need to see is that there is something which is called as a notochord all right now what exactly is a notochord let's see that what uh, that is all about now first let's see when i'm talking about something which is called as a chordate okay what is let's break up this word which is chordate in the word chordate the first thing that's there is chord all right now when i'm saying chord what i basically mean is a notochord now what's the notochord it's coming right up okay so chordate are these animals which are bearing okay ata a t e that is ata that is having or bearing bearing what bearing a string or a cord and where is this string or cord this string or cord is exactly placed right now where your spinal cord is previously that used to be the notochord all right so it is basically the concept goes that notochord is going to develop into a spinal cord then this is what makes you a vertebrate but sometimes what happens is those there are some animals in which notochord is not present at all so if notochord is not present can i call those animals as non chordates okay so we have chordates the ones with the notochord and non chordates being the ones without the notochord all right so what exactly is a notochord let's see over here okay first of all this notochord is comprising of this what you're seeing here children this is a basic feature or rather a basic layout of how a how the skeleton should be of a developing chordate all right so if it is a developing chordate then we have to have a notochord all right what exactly is a notochord it is a stiff rod like structure and that whole notochord over here where is the notochord can you locate it here this over here this is the notochord all right now this stiff rod like structure and what is it made up of it's made up of many cells and these cells have large large vacuoles in them that's why it's written it is made up of tightly packed vacuolated cells that is what the notochord is made up of all right so we see that it also runs along the mid dorsal line if you see in this animal this would be the ventral side of it this would be the dorsal side so since it is in the middle it is called as the mid dorsal side always remember the dorsal side is the one which faces the sun and the ventral side is the one which faces the earth or the surface all right now when i want to classify an animal all right so now when i before i classify the animal let's just come to how the animals are going to be classified according to chordates and non chordates all right so what i'd like to do is first i'd like to enlist the names of the phylums and then we go on to classifying them all right so first we start with animals okay now what were those animals called which have or don't which rather which don't have notochords didn't we call those animals as non chordates those were called as non chordates okay whereas the ones with notochord we call those as chordates okay chordates we will be discussing in the later on lectures right now in today's lecture we'll mostly be focusing on the non chordate phylums and ahead also all right so chordates we will see later let's just first step take it step by step and we want to learn just the names of the phylums which belong to non chordates all right so let's begin with that the first phylum in non chordates would be phylum the most primitive one and that is phylum porifera it's phylum porifera all right the second one 
would be phylum nidaria you might know nidaria uh, as other names okay do you remember any other names for nidaria nidaria could also be called as cilentrata okay the third phylum would be phylum tenophora okay now after these are done number phylum number 4 5 and 6 these three are comprising of the worms all right now in the worms first worm that comes would be the flat worm so i call that as platy helminthes okay second worm would be the round worm that is going to be called as aschelminthes and finally the third worm which is like for example the worms which have rings in them those will be called as annelida okay so let's just group them up first were the first the initial ones and forifera nidaria tenophora then came the three worms the flat worms the round worms and the ring worms all right after that a annelida after that immediately the next one is also a for arthropoda okay all right after arthropoda would come mollusca okay after mollusca are those animals which have spines on their body that would be called as echinodermata all right and the last one well if we see the last one characteristics of them these are the animals which are having some characteristics of non chordates and some characteristics of chordates so i can put them in between but because they don't have a notochord that's why i will put them under non chordates and i'll call it as hemi hemi chordata Okay so what is most important is initially we know the names of the phylums especially those of the non chordates all right so remember in the groups first group phylum porifera phylum porifera then nidaria and tenophora all right second group is that of the worms the flat worm platyhelminthes the round worm aschelminthes and the ring worm that's annelida after annelida a for annelida next one comes arthropoda so after arthropoda mollusca echinodermata and finally hemichordata so now once these are done once you your your uh, verbally sound with these names then classifying the animals and remembering their examples becomes much easier all right so let's begin whenever we want to classify an animal there are different ways on which we are going to be classifying them so the basis of classification could depend on various parameters first let's see what is the level of organization or the different levels of organization which we are able to see in different animals then we would come to symmetry then we would come to the number of germ layers i'll i'll teach you in a bit what exactly is germ layers okay then we'd come to something called as the coelom which actually refers to cavity all right then come segmentations whether the animal is having segmentations on it externally internally or not all right then comes finally we already spoke about this and that is the notochord so children let's begin the first way that we are going to be classifying animals would be on the basis of the level of organization now what does this mean level of organization means whether the animal that you are talking about is it having only cells or in that animal has cells come together and form tissues have tissues come together and actually manage to form an organ so that's where how we can classify them on the basis of levels of organization if at all the animal is there for example a sponge always remember these sponges sponges belong to phylum porifera well these sponges are always the simplest of them all so whenever we're going to do any methods of classification the simplest one will always mostly have the example of 
porifera all right now this porifera's they have only and only cells and these cells even though the cells may be similar remember what comes what comes together to form a tissue tissue is formed by cells which are similar similar in what shape structure function origin so when these come together they may form they they may be able they should be able to form a tissue but what's happening here although there may be similar cells here but what's missing here is that there are no junctions which are present between the cells so there is nothing basically to hold on the cells together in a way where it can come together to form a tissue that is why these porifera's remain as cellular grade of organization they do not the cells do not come together and advance to form a tissue all right so in phylum porifera or sponges it is cellular next is tissue grade of organization this what you are seeing here is a cylentrata this is a jellyfish jellyfish be belongs to cylentrate or you may also call this as nidaria okay we can call this as nidaria also very beautiful jellyfish over here but it is not having organs it has only tissues one more example could be hydra also all right then next when we talk about the organ system level of organization or, or or rather only organ level of only organ where the organs have not come together and coordinated to form a complete system so only organ would be the phylum platyhelminthes all right platyhelminthes and after that would come the organ and organ systems okay that would be phylum annelids okay even all the advanced animals more advanced than porifera's and nidarians arthropods mollusks echinoderms all of these would be classified as organ system level of organization okay now when we're talking about the animals with organ system level then these animals could have some sorts of complexity some sorts of differentiations all right let's see what they could be they could be having an indi incomplete digestive system all right when i'm saying incomplete digestive system this means that the digestive system has only and only one opening can you see over here this is a uh, flat worm all right so can you see that over here there is only one opening and children this is a common opening for the food to go in also and for the waste to come out also it's a common opening for that all right so this here is what we would call as a incomplete digestive system whereas some animals are there where the mouth is separate and the anus is separate and that too they are at opposite ends these would be referred to as a complete digestive system all right where mouth and anus are separate and located at opposite ends in the body all right now next coming to number of germ layers now the first question would be what is germ layers if you remember we had done this when we started the topic of tissues i told you that there are basically in our body there are three germ layers the outermost being the ectoderm the innermost being the endoderm and the one in the middle being the mesoderm all right but this is not the case for all animals the animals which are of a simpler form they have they are arising only from two germ layers okay not three so now if i'm saying those two germ layers are there let's see what that is all about so the animals which are coming from two germ layers and three germ layers are differentiated as these are going to be having only outer ectoderm and inner endoderm whereas the animals with three germ layers are going to be having all the three that is outer ectoderm inner or rather the middle layer which will be called as the mesoderm and the innermost layer which is the endoderm all right now when i'm saying that the these have only an ectoderm and endoderm then is there anything in between there is something in between those two layers but that is a non cellular area now if it is a non cellular area can i say it is a non living area okay and that non cellular non living area is going to be called as mesoglea what is it going to be called as mesoglea so mesoglea is present only in the animals which are arising from two germ layers because in the animals with three germ layers in between ectoderm and endoderm we already have one germ layer which we know as the mesoderm all right okay now the animals with two germ layers since there are only two germ layers this is called as the diploblastic animal okay diplo means two and the animals with three germ layers are the ones which are called as 
triploblastic animals okay a diploblast and a triploblast all right so now let's just see the examples there when i'm talking about diploblastic i mean two germ layers okay let's see how it looks like first we have the innermost layer which is the endoderm all right in the middle is there a mesoderm no there isn't what is the layer in between that layer is non cellular non living and we call it as the mesoglea okay outer to that mesoglea would be an outermost layer which we call as the ectoderm so there is the ectoderm the mesoglea and the endoderm all right example over here would be a hydra and hydra belongs to the phylum cnidaria don't worry about this when we study ahead the phylums you will understand which examples belong to which phylums okay so that is cnidaria all right coming forward to the triploblastic animals these are the ones with three germ layers okay now here there is the endoderm the mesoderm and the ectoderm all right example here look at this over here the example can you see over here that this is the mesoderm okay this is the ectoderm and this is the endoderm so that's how we saying that there are three layers here hence i call it as a triploblastic animal all right now next so we completed with the number of germ layers we've completed with the level of organization we continue now ahead with the body plan now if i'm using the word body plan a plan is generally a basic outlook okay if a builder is constructing a building then before actually he puts the bricks on the full floor he's going to have a play up a layout of how this building is going to look like after it is constructed so a plan is basically how the whole appearance or the whole structure is going to be like now according to the body plans we can classify these animals into three different ways the first way would be as a cell aggregate okay we'll see what that is in a while second way would be a where it is a blind sac body plan and the third one being a tube within a tube so there are two tubes here all right so let's see what the difference is in all of these when i say cell aggregate what is aggregate mean aggregate means all the cells being put together cell aggregate basically would mean the simplest animals that is the poriferans the sponges and over here it's just that all the cells are put together and there is no uh, there's no forming of any tissue so naturally there's no basic body plan over here blind sac would mean first of all understand the word blind blind word in zoology do not consider this to be something where you can't see zoology mein the blind word means that it is having only one opening okay it is having only one opening that is called as blind sac all right tube within tube would mean that these are the advanced animals which have a tube within a tube what does this mean let's see my first tube i'm talking about the digestive system if i talk about digestive system one part is the mouth second part being the anus isn't that one tube yes or no all right now this one tube of your digestive system is lying inside your whole body imagine your body to be another tube or your body wall to be another tube so doesn't this comprise or doesn't this satisfy what we're talking about a tube digestive system inside another tube your body wall so this is a tube within a tube body pattern okay these are seen in advanced animals so over here there's just an aggregation of cells over here the digestive system has only one opening so when you see the structural part of it this is basically how it looks like you can see that there is only one opening here this is going to be common for the mouth to allow things in and for the anus to allow things to come out all right all right now next when we talk about tube within tube over here the digestive system has two openings and in these two openings there is one opening at each end so this is one opening for the mouth okay and this is another opening for the anus all right okay now since we've done this over here there are no tissues and no organs obviously organs and tissues will be present in these two let's come to the examples cell aggregate most simplest animals can i say that the example would be of poriferans that is sponges next when i talk about blind sac what is this jellyfish which phylum can i call this as cnidaria okay cnidaria third when i talk about tube within tube look at this here annelida 
okay that is an earthworm then all of this even this this is the uh, nematodes means the round worms okay the aschelmenthes all of them would be tube within tube okay now when i talk about the body symmetry okay body symmetry would be how exactly is that animal going to be able to be equal halves okay either you will have animals that no matter what type of plane you want to put it in you you want to put across it it's not going to be able to divide that animal into two equal halves that would be known as asymmetrical then we have other two which are called as radially symmetrical and bilaterally symmetrical let's see what the difference is between these two asymmetrical is understood that the body can never be divided into two equal halves when i say radial radial would mean that as long as the axis which you want to divide it in okay you want to cut it as long as that axis is passing through the center it will divide the animal into two equal halves okay so it can have many axis which divides it into two equal halves but when i am talking about the bilateral symmetry like imagine a butterfly okay how many axes can be drawn on that body of the butterfly which is going to divide it into two equal halves only one axis so this is an animal which is known as a bilaterally symmetrical animal where the two identical halves are formed only on one plane okay so let's see some examples here cell aggregate examples would be the also the asymmetrical example would be the poriferans again that is the sponges porifera okay second we would see the radially symmetrical ones like starfish starfish belongs to the phylum echinodermata okay this is radially symmetrical so there could be various planes or various axes that is drawn as long as it passes through the center it will be able to divide the animal into two equal halves okay and even hydra now hydra is phylum which phylum it was the phylum nidaria but when you see hydra you might think that okay the the division has to be done at the level of these tentacles no whenever we want to divide a hydra uh, according to the symmetry then you have to exclude the tentacles and just talk about the whole body as a whole okay we're not including the tentacles during symmetry all right so that was radially symmetrical many uh, axes can pass through as long as it is passing through the center it will divide the animal into two equal halves coming next to bilaterally symmetrical the, the uh, animals which are a little advanced look at these here beautiful animals okay all of these are bilaterally symmetrical okay now after symmetry let's come to another way that we can classify these animals and those would be according to their body cavity okay now another word for body cavity would be coelom okay whenever in our body whenever we have a big cavity we call it as coelom whenever we have smaller cavities you would refer to it as sinuses maybe okay so here we have a talking about the coelom now when we talk about coelom what exactly is the coelom coelom is there or that space okay coelom means cavity so it is the cavity which is formed between the body wall and the digestive system or you can call it as the alimentary canal the space between body wall and alimentary canal is what we are going to be calling as coelom but now there is a, another way or there's an other uh, aspect to this too and let's see what that is now they've taken a cross section of this animal here okay on the cross section we see that the outermost layer can you see there are two three layers here this is the first layer this is the second layer and this over here is the third layer okay now can i do one thing is what we'll do is we will coincide this with the germ layers do you remember the germ layers outermost layer was the ectoderm okay middle layer was the mesoderm all right and the innermost layer was the endoderm all right now out of this this being the body wall the outermost layer this being the middle part of the whole body the middle layer and this over here this dotted structure that you are seeing being the alimentary canal the innermost part that is the endoderm now if you see in this area where only concentrate right now on the mesoderm when you see the mesoderm you can see that it has been split 
Actually, the whole mesoderm is this whole area over here. This whole area is the mesoderm, isn't it? Now, what has happened to this mesoderm? That mesoderm has been split in such a way that a part of the mesoderm is going to be lining the ectoderm. That is, I am talking about this part over here. And also, a part of the mesoderm is going to be covering the endoderm. So, can you see over here how this part of the mesoderm is covering the endoderm? So, now what has happened? The mesoderm has been split into two equal halves. And on splitting this into two equal halves, a cavity is formed in the between. So, here, this cavity that you are seeing over here, this exactly this space here. This space that we have over here is what I am going to be calling as mycelium. Okay, coelom means that there is a proper splitting into two equal halves of which germ layer of the mesoderm. Okay, so that is the coelom over there. Now, let's see over here, either the animal may not have a coelom where we are going to be calling, calling them as acelomates or the animal may have a coelom or something that looks like a coelom, but it is not actually a coelom, which we will call them as pseudocelomates. We will see in a while what that means. Or the animal has a proper coelom like we just saw, that would be called as the coelomate. Okay. Now, animals which don't have coelom at all, let's see how they look like. No body cavity, false body cavity and true body cavity. A coelomates, over here what happens is, can you see, the, again, we are going to coincide these layers with the germ layers. This is the outer part or the body wall and I am coinciding that with the outermost germ layer that is ectoderm. Then comes the middle part that I am coinciding with mesoderm. And then comes the digestive system, innermost part, I am coinciding that with the endoderm. Okay, So, there are three parts to it, the ectoderm, then the endoderm and then the mesoderm. Now, what we see here is this mesoderm layer, can you see that the mesoderm, does it look like it has been split on any plane, on any basis, has it been split? Not at all. So, there is no splitting of mesoderm. So, that is why there is no coelom formed and these are called as acelomates. So, now what basically is this whole area going to be filled with? Okay, this spa the space between the body wall and elementary canal. It is filled with tissue and that tissue is going to be called as parenchymitis. So, this is basically the functional tissue which is present in these animals. Which animal is this? Flatworm. Flatworm. What is the phylum? What is the scientific name for that? Isn't it called as platyhelminthes? Okay, it is called as platyhelminthes. Now, next when we talk about the pseudocelomates, here what happens is there are spaces present between or rather in the mesoderm. The mesoderm has split. But remember when I spoke about coelom, I wanted you to remember that mesoderm has to be split in such a way that one part of the mesoderm is lining the body wall. The second part of the mesoderm is covering the elementary canal. So, we see here that, that if at all there is splitting of mesoderm, means a cavity is there. But look at this cavity here. The mesoderm has gone here. Is there any mesoderm around the endoderm? No, there isn't. So, this is what I am calling as a false cavity. This is not meeting the requirements as to call it as a true cavity. Sometimes, maybe if at all, it is not like this only. Sometimes, you may find it as patches. So, you may just find patches here of mesoderm. Patch of mesoderm. Over here also, a patch of mesoderm. Here also a patch of mesoderm and what happens, what do you see over here? Can't you see that this whole area is, is empty and that is the cavity in between. But is this a real cavity that we require? No, it is not. That is why I am calling this as a false cavity. Another word for false could be pseudo. So, that is why these are called as pseudo coelomates. All right. Coming next to the true coelomates. True coelomates is just like what we saw a little while back. Okay. Over here, can you see this worm? where this is an analid and in this analid we have that the mesoderm has been split. So, when we are talking about the mesoderm, this layer here, okay, this whole region, this is the mesoderm, okay, and then this region here, this is also the mesoderm, okay, and whatever part you are seeing in between, okay, this region in between is the cavity. 
okay so this is what we will call as the coelom okay so that's how the coelom is formed and these are the animals which we will call as the true coelomates either they may be called as coelomates or they may also be called as u coelomates where u always means true do you remember eukaryotes so true true nucleus in the cell okay so a coelomates pseudo coelomates and coelomates all right now <clears throat> over here when we have that the coelom is present then always remember in our body there is no cavity which is ever left empty okay if we have a cavity most of those cavities are always going to be filled with some sort of fluid so the fluid which is filled in the coelom i will call that as a coelomic fluid okay coelomic fluid all right so let's come towards the examples examples of a coelomates the primitive animals okay a coelomates no coelom remember in this coelom category we're going to classify them and the differentiations come at the level of the three worms which was our first worm it was platyhelminthes second worm round worm aschelminthes third worm ring worm annelida so platyhelminthes aschelminthes annelida when we see a coelomates these are falling under the category of platyhelminthes okay when we talk about the coelom or the the pseudo coelomates this is the second type of worm that is the round worm or the aschelminthes okay and the third one the true coelomates are annelid onwards okay so the three worms are the three ways that we can classify these coelomate animals okay so that's earthworm or even cockroaches these are all this is which phylum this is phylum annelid okay and these are phylum arthropoda okay arthropoda all right. so that completes the coelom now let's move on and we move on towards the body segmentation now when we think about segmentation we only think about the worms okay but that's not true only those rings or those stripes that you are seeing on the external body surface is not only segmentation children segmentation can also be things or divisions like head thorax abdomen so even we are having body segments okay which are our body segments our head our thorax our abdomen these are the segments of our body yes segmentation is also referred to as those rings or those lines that you are able to see on the bodies of worms okay now when i'm talking about segmentation if at all if at all the body of the animal is in such a way that there is an external segmentation and there is an internal segmentation too now how would you find out about internal segmentation if at all on that external segmentation if it loses its uh, cuticle if it loses the outermost part of its body and you throw it out you just want to observe observe the internal part of the body and if the internal part also has similar types of segmentation where external also had the lines at the same region internal also the body is divided in the similar way then this type of segmentation where external is going to be coinciding with the internal one then this is going to be called as a metamerism or metameric metameric segmentation okay metameric segmentation this phenomenon where the animals are having this kind of metameric segmentation that phenomenon can be called as meta merism okay that is called as metamerism and the segmentation is called as metameric segmentation what is metameric segmentation where the external segmentation is coinciding with the internal segmentation okay so we see here another way the uh, one more way in which we could classify an animal that would be on the basis of the support that your body the body is having now what is the structure which gives support to the body isn't it the skeleton well when we talk about skeleton either the skeleton could be on the outer surface of the body which would be the exoskeleton or we may have or the animal may have an internal skeleton which would be the endoskeleton now exoskeleton do we have an exoskeleton ever thought about it would you agree with me if i say that skin is an exoskeleton is it 
didn't we just learn a couple of lectures back that skin is a tissue okay and an epithelial tissue also comprising of connective but what is an exoskeleton all the structures which are on the skin on the skin can i say structures like hair structures like nails or if in some animal structures like the hooves or the uh, horns these are all going to be forms of exoskeleton because these are the structures which are on the skin and that would be exoskeleton okay so some animals with exo some animals like us with a major part of the endoskeleton skeleton is basically meant for providing support for providing strength okay so in lower animals these are the animals that have only exoskeleton for example the cockroach all right second when we talk about higher animals they would have both exo and endo but we know that for us okay the major skeleton the one doing all the work that a skeleton should do that would be done by the endoskeleton whereas animals like these the major work of protection and support is being done by its exoskeleton okay all right so this is basically how it is higher animals okay now we come to this uh, chart which is present in our ncrt textbook very very important chart for our neat exams okay now when we see this chart i'd like you to look at the extreme left okay in the extreme left you already know all of this okay can you see over here in the extreme left all the phylums are given okay the phylums you know the names of those phylums right remember you had the phylums which were initially the first three remember we grouped them together and on grouping them together we have porifera we have nidaria we have tenophora okay that was our first group second grouping was the three worms the three worms were first the flat worm platyhelminthes second the round worm aschelminthes third the ring worm annelida then after annelida i taught you after a comes another a and that would be arthropoda okay then after arthropoda mollusca echinodermata hemichordata and the last phylum being the chordata okay so remember these 10 especially right now i'd like you to remember up till hemichordata okay these are all the animals or all the phylums which were belonging to the non chordates okay now ahead come to the next layer or the next column these are the germ layers in germ layers do you remember how did we classify them if they had only if the animal has only two germ layers then we called it as diploblastic now in diploblastic can you tell me which was the layer in between didn't i call it as mesoglea okay so now let's see which animals are diploblastic and which animals are further triploblastic and where does the differentiation lie in look at here porifera nidaria tenophora the initial ones the simpler ones these are all diploblastic diploblastic then platyhelminthes onwards okay platyhelminthes onwards is going to be triploblast so first what i'd like you to do is i'll move outside for a second and i'd like you to take a screenshot of this screen all right now when you have this screenshot later on what you'll do is you'll just copy this down in your notebook here over here at this level of triploblastic being around or being alongside of which animal the platyhelminthes so in the germ layers it is the differentiation is coming at the level of the platyhelminthes where it becomes triploblastic onwards okay so if i'm talking about the germ layers then from porifera to tenophora diploblastic platyhelminthes onwards triploblastic okay next way that we can classify them was based on body plan do you remember what was body plan it was the basic layout of the animal and when we talk about the body plan there were three ways that we spoke about first was cell aggregate second was the blind sac with one opening only third was the tube within the tube with two openings mouth and anus okay so we have here the three different types look at over here cell aggregate was in the poriferans then when we talk about the nidaria it was blind sac okay nidaria which animals hydra jellyfish then look at this one tenophora is a tube within tube it just comes randomly in between and then platyhelminthes do you remember i showed you the flat worms those worms the planaria had only one opening common for mouth as well as for anus okay so here this is another blind sac over here but then 
as till length is onwards that is the round worm onwards till the ending it is all going to be tube within tube okay so here what i'd like you to do is we'll ma mark a star where there is some sort of differentiation okay and then a star over here also that we know this is the demarcation from which it is tube within tube onwards okay so we have cell aggregate blind sacs and then tube within tube one tube within tube is present here that's why we've marked a star over there too okay all right now let's move ahead the next way that we can classify was according to the body symmetry and in symmetry you had asymmetrical radially symmetrical bilaterally symmetrical remember those so now let's see them when we talk about the poriferans these are the ones which are completely asymmetrical now let's demarcate the ones which are radially symmetrical for that you have the phylum nidaria the phylum tenophora and come all the way down even at the level of echinodermata there's going to be radial symmetry all right and where does bilateral start from over here from the fourth one that is the worms onwards that is the platyhelminthes onwards okay just remember one exception like how you had an exception over here let's just circle that this is one exception here this is one exception over here all right next we come to after all right after symmetry we come to the next one that is coelom now what was coelom coelom basically meant cavity and when i'm talking about cavity i mean that this is formed by splitting of the mesoderm layer and that mesoderm layer splitting forms a cavity in between okay so we had either acelomates or we had pseudocelomates or we had true coelomates okay now when we talk about coelom you have acelomates look at this acelomates come all the way up till the level of the worms i told you that the classification or the three ones are differentiated at the level of worms itself which were our worms flatworm roundworm and ringworm platyhelminthes aschelminthes and alida okay now here up till up till the platyhelminthes it is acelomate up till platyhelminthes then one only aschelminthes is the one which is a coelomate and then uh, or is the one which is a pseudocelomate and then the last one annelid onwards you can see annelid it is going to start the coelomate onwards is all completely coelomate okay so you can see over here that when we are talking about coelom the differentiation is lying at the level of the three worms first one a coelomate pseudocelomate and true coelomate onwards okay now last one we're talking about organization remember in organization it was whether it is only cells whether it comes to form a tissue or whether it can form an organ organ system so we see here that cellular is present only for poriferans okay the remaining two nidaria tenophora are tissue level but organ organ system all of this begins from phylum platyhelminthes onwards okay platyhelminthes onwards it would be considered as organ and organ system now again i'm going to just move for a minute and i'd like you to uh, take a screenshot of this slide so that you can find all the demarcations of how they are differentiating this whole chart that is there on the slide right now extremely extremely very 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 important for your neat exams so i need you to please copy these down take it out on a paper stick it in your ncert textbook so that it's there with you forever okay staple it on your ncert textbook if you want to and also you need to know where all i've marked these red stars these red stars are the ones where they pick out so many mcqs with okay so once this chart is known to you that's why what we did is before we started this whole chapter i made you learn the names of the phylum once you know the names of the phylum spit pack that too you need to know those names in order okay when you know those names in order half of your work is done because then this table as we have understood it it becomes much easier to learn okay so now if you have if you had remember these randomly it would not be so easy to classify this table so that's why remember these words or memorize these phylums accordingly to their one after the other that is how actually the development has arisen so let's not jumble those up okay now before all this let's before we conclude our lecture let us just come and sum it up all right we'll sum it up where 
okay, I need a blank screen. How all, or rather, where all, what all, what all were the ways that we had classified the animals? Let's just have a brief skeleton of that so you have it in your notes. Okay. Now, for classifying animals, the first way that we classified them were on the basis of the level of organization. Level of Right here, organization. Okay. In level of organization, do you remember how many we had? Here, we had the first one, cellular. Second one, tissue. Third one, organ. And then the last one, organ system. Alright, now after this, the second one. After level of organization, second one as the body plan. In the body plan, remember there were three types of body plans. The first one being cell aggregate. The second one being the blind sac. Okay. And the third one being tube within tube. All right, next way. Third way, let's come to number of germ layers. Do you remember this? Number of germ layers would be two ways. Either the animal is having two germ layers, which is called as a diploblastic. Okay, two, or it could have three germ layers, which we will call as triploblastic. Three germ layers. Okay, so this is the third way. What was the other ways that we had done? What were the other ways that we classified an animal? Okay, can we do it on the basis of the body symmetry? In body symmetry, we had three ways where you can not, first way where you cannot divide it into equal halves under any circumstances, where I'll call it as asymmetrical. Okay. Second one, any plane which passes through the center divides it into two equal halves radially. Okay. And the third one, only one plane that passes through the center can divide into two equal halves bilateral. Alright. Now, after this, another way. <clears throat> we come to coelom. Okay. Now, what was coelom? Remember that was in coelom the splitting of of mesoderm okay now in coelom remember there were also three parts either the animal could be an a coelomate okay or the animal may have a coelom but that's not class that do not that is not satisfying what i want in a coelom so this is what we had called as pseudo we call these as pseudo coelomates Okay, and the third one being true coelomates, I'll call it as u coelomates. All right, okay, now after this, what else did we do? Do you remember that? Can we have the body support 
or body segmentation. Let's not forget body segmentation. All right. Now, in body segmentation, remember that if at all the external segmentation is found to be coinciding with the internal segmentation, then what did I call it as? Didn't I call it as metamerism? So, in body segmentation, I will write down what is metamerism when external sorry when external segmentation coincides with internal segmentation okay what was this called as this is going to be called as metamerism or metameric segmentation all right and the last way that we had classified an animal was on the body support Okay, now this body support if we are seeing in the lower animals and in the higher animals it was different. So, let us classify first on lower animals. Okay, and for higher animals. Now, these lower animals had only exoskeleton. Okay, whereas the higher animals had both, both exo and endo. All right. So these were the different ways that we had classified animals. What I'd like you to do is, along with that table, please take a screenshot of this as well and do note it down in your notebooks. This is very, very, very important for all MCQs coming from this chapter, okay, in your NEET exam. This chapter, in from your NCRT, this belongs to a part of the chapter which is called as Animal Kingdom, Kingdom Animalia and it is a chapter with a very heavy weightage in your NEET exam. Every year, at least two to three MCQs do come from this chapter. So, the first initial part, that is how you are going to classify the animals, this is the foundation of those, that whole chapter which is going to be Hence, uh, onwards, we're going to be starting in our lectures. So, please do make sure, children, for your NEET exams, your Animal Kingdom chapter is thorough, pit, pat. You don't want any confusion in this chapter. Because always remember, ahead when we're going to do physiology and everything, it's not only going to be human, but questions do come in the NEET about the uh, and linking it with the animal kingdom as well. So, once your animal kingdom is your strong factor and you're confident on it, it makes the MCQ solving much, much, much easier. Please do uh, listen, please do understand this, how important this chapter would be, okay? So, you need to know, first of all, the notochord we did. We did how the notochord is dividing it into non-chordates and chordates. Then we saw the phylum names of all the non-chordates. Remember, we will be remembering the names of the phylum 1 to 10 in their order only in that particular sequence. I don't want it up and down. I don't want any messing around with that because according to that sequence, we did that chart. Remember the chart. So, we did this chart over here. Okay. The chart was this one over here. Okay. So, this chart is supposed to be pit pat for us with those MCQs or with those highlighting points which I had marked with the stars. Okay. And after all this is done, we need to know the how that how did we classify the animals. Okay. The different patterns, the skeletons that we made over here was how the animal classification was done. Okay. So, children, please do pay attention. This is a very crucial chapter, very critical chapter and also it is very interesting too. So, why not? Let's just head over and let's head on towards 
aiming at our NEET exam right from today. Okay, chalo. Uh, all the best and uh, do take care until we meet in our next lecture and do have these written in your notebooks too. Okay, solve today's DPP also. All right, if you have any doubts, I'm there on the Yup Master app. Do log into the app and. Uh, Post your doubts over there. It's very simple to find it out. Okay. And I'll be answering them personally. All right. Chalo. Bye-bye, children. Take care and see you next time.